of year again. The holidays are upon us. We've just wrapped up Halloween, and in a few days we'll celebrate Thanksgiving. And then we'll begin our weeks-long celebration of Advent and Christmas. This time of year is always strange. On the one hand, everything seems a bit more magical with the smell of turkey in the air and under the glow of twinkling lights. Hallmark movies and TV ads feature tableaus of happy, smiling families gathered around tables and trees, thrilled to be together. On the other hand, this season can feel deeply lonely and difficult. The magic of the holidays feels like a farce and we can't muster up that warm, fuzzy feeling that's expected of us this time of year. This year, there's a shadow over our cheery celebrations as we continue to hear news of war in Ukraine, unthinkable violence in Gaza and Israel, mass shootings and threats of mass shootings, and political chaos at every level. If the collective pain isn't enough, we've got plenty going on in our personal lives. Grief for a loved one who died and won't be able to celebrate with us this year. Complicated or toxic family dynamics that make us dread getting together. Financial stress from a difficult economic year, health issues, mental illness, addiction, faith crises that have left us wondering how to celebrate when we don't believe the same way we did last year. It's a lot to take in, and as we enter this season, we may be asking, how can I give thanks when my life is falling apart? How can I sing of Christmas hope when the world is on fire? Today, we're going to try to answer those questions and figure out where we can find hope in all of this. Let's start by taking a journey back to the Roman Empire. According to Acts chapter 17, Paul is on his second missionary journey and he finds himself in the coastal city of Thessalonica in Greece. Thessalonica is a large, important trade city for the Roman Empire and populated with people from Jewish, Greek, and Roman religious traditions. One cultic religion was the worship of Roma, which was the embodiment of the ideals of the Roman Empire. The worship of Roma was one of many ways that the empire maintained power and control over the people it conquered, especially in a city as important as Thessalonica. Paul and his companion Silas arrive in Thessalonica and begin teaching in the Jewish synagogue about Jesus. Many of the Greek people who heard their teachings were convinced and converted to Christianity. As you can imagine, this made a lot of people angry, and they gathered the city authorities to hunt Paul and Silas down to charge them with treason for teaching against the emperor and the empire. In the Roman Empire, the emperor was the only king, the only deity. But Paul and Silas taught that Jesus was the true and only king that people should follow. The crowd looked for them and complained that they were turning the world upside down with their teachings and needed to be stopped. Paul and Silas got away from Thessalonica before they were caught, but their teachings about Jesus left a lasting mark. They had successfully turned the world upside down for hundreds of Thessalonians, encouraging them to follow in the way of Jesus and not in the way of the emperor. After Paul left, he was worried about the Thessalonian church. They were facing backlash and persecution for following Christ, and Paul was no stranger to those things. He'd been imprisoned, beaten, and run out of countless towns for sharing the gospel. So he sent Timothy, another disciple, to check on them. When Timothy returns with good news, Paul sits down to write the Thessalonians a letter, praying for them and offering encouragement and wisdom for their church as they continue to grow. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 through 3, Paul writes, we always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says that the reputation of the Thessalonian church is so strong that it is spreading to other churches throughout the empire, encouraging and strengthening them as they face their own troubles. Thousands of years later, we probably have a little trouble understanding the truly radical nature of the Thessalonian and other early Christian communities. 
They were living under an oppressive empire that demanded they worship the Roman Empire and follow their laws and customs, no matter how unjust. By following Jesus, these early Christians were committing treason. They were choosing the values of love and justice and compassion as Jesus taught them, not the empire. And there were real consequences for this. Many were executed and imprisoned and harassed for their beliefs, Paul included. And yet, when Paul writes to these early churches, he always includes a word of gratitude and hope at the beginning of his letters. He tells them that the way they are following Jesus and caring for each other, even when times are hard, gives him hope. They keep choosing to do the right thing, despite knowing they might lose their lives for it. The Thessalonians in particular are known for their active faith. Paul gives thinks that their faith inspires their work, their love inspires their labor, and their hope in Jesus inspires them to keep going. They are taking care of the poor and making sure that everyone has what they need. They are spreading the message of Jesus to other people. They are resisting the ways of the empire, which values power and money over human life. Though most of us here today are not experiencing the violence and persecution that Paul and the Thessalonians did, we still have a lot to learn from them about gratitude and hope. First, they did not dismiss the reality of their pain and suffering. Paul acknowledges that he has been worried about them because he knows that they are facing real challenges and danger for following Jesus. Paul acknowledges his own very real suffering. We don't have to pretend everything is perfect or even just okay to find gratitude and hope. Joy and pain can coexist. For those of us having a hard year, we can be honest about it as we enter the holidays, even if just with ourselves. And for those of us who are actually doing pretty well, we can celebrate this season and still acknowledge that the world is in turmoil. Second, Paul found hope when he heard about the way the Thessalonians were living out their faith by caring for each other. He found hope in the way they loved and said it filled him with gratitude. I've always found concepts like gratitude and hope very abstract. I know what they feel like, but I don't know how to explain them. In order to experiencing them, I need to see or experience something tangible, especially when life is difficult. I follow a writer and illustrator on Instagram who goes by the handle Oh Happy Danny. Some of you may have heard of her. Danielle Koch Balfour creates art about living a more just and hopeful life. Recently, she began a series answering the question, What do I do with all of this terrible news? In one illustration, she says that instead of turning away from pain and suffering, she will let it expand her capacity to love beyond what she thinks she is capable of. In another illustration, she asks, where is hope in this horror? Hope is the doctor holding the hand of a trembling patient. Hope is the smile of a cashier in the checkout line. Hope is protest. Hope is prayer. Hope lives in the keepers of light, those renewing our faith in humanity, who in doing their good work bear the image of the invisible God. Both Paul and Danielle remind us that God's presence is evident when we show up for one another, when we care for people who are suffering, when we speak out against violence and injustice, when we share a meal with people who are hungry, when we open our homes and our arms to each other in good times and bad. We can have hope and gratitude that God is still working that humanity is not all bad and that things can and will change. We can have hope that we don't have to go through hard times alone. We can have gratitude for the people who keep showing up, who keep speaking up, who keep loving even when it's hard. This congregation gives me hope and makes me grateful all year, but this weekend has been a particularly special one for us. On Saturday, volunteers distributed your Thanksgiving bag donations to several hundred local families in need of food. Youth and adults volunteered for our largest buddy break since before COVID, serving 16 kids with special needs and giving their families some respite time. 
and even more volunteers helped prep the supplies needed for our Sunday Build-A-Bed event. That's right, today volunteers of all ages will be in our gym building 25 beds for JCPS students. There are 6,000 JCPS students across every school that experience home insecurity. These beds will make an impact for those students by providing them with a safe, comfortable place to sleep. I'm grateful for the ways you consistently show up for people. This congregation has made an important choice not to be complacent or self-centered. We've decided to take Jesus seriously and do the hard but important work of loving other people in real and tangible ways. We've decided not to accept suffering and injustice as the status quo and instead work to alleviate it and change things. We're not perfect at it and we're constantly learning and growing, but we're trying. And that gives me hope because I see that God has not abandoned us. God is still working and is very present here. This is how we have gratitude and find hope when it feels like our lives are falling apart and the world is on fire. We give thanks for the people who do not turn away from suffering and injustice, but show up to help. We give thanks that there are ways for us to make a difference, one small act of love at a time. We find hope that things can change, that suffering and evil will not have the last word. If you need some hope and gratitude over the next few weeks, I invite you to try a couple of things. First, like Paul, take some time to give thanks for specific people in your life or in the world. You can tell them, sure, but you can also just name them for yourself. Think of people who have been there for you in the last year, moments when you saw someone making a difference or ways that you have grown and changed. Revisit that list when life gets overwhelming or when you feel hopeless. Let it be a reminder that there is good in the world and in your life. Second, like the Thessalonians, find a way to put your faith and love into action. Think of something that breaks your heart or a cause that lights a fire within you. What's something you can do to make a difference in that area? It doesn't have to be a grand gesture. Start small. Maybe it's making a phone call to your legislator or volunteering for an event or donating when you see a need. Maybe it's spending time learning more about that issue and discussing it with other people. Maybe it's showing up for someone in your life who you know is having a hard time right now. Whatever it is, taking that one small step forward will help you find the hope you are looking for because there is always something you can do. The holidays can be a beautiful time of year, but they can also be so hard. My prayer for all of us over the next month or so is that we can find pockets of hope and things to be truly grateful for, that we can be honest about the difficulties and celebrate the good things, that we can continue to show up for one another, being the presence of Christ in a time when we need it most. Amen.